An ancient colossal head, discovered in the southeastern lowlands of Mexico during the 19th century, was destined to introduce a new phase of Mesoamerican archaeology. It was the first observed example of an art style represented by later finds in the area. Each new discovery brought researchers closer to the sites where long-vanished artisans had worked. These sites, while a basically Mesoamerican pattern, as evidenced by pyramids, stone sculpture, and carved jade, displayed characteristic differences. The monolithic flat-topped altars, the sculptured monuments, the art style itself could not be classified as Mayan, Zapotec, or Aztec. By 1932, it became obvious that a separate and distinctive culture was represented. It was given the name of Olmec. As far as we know, the Olmec heartland lay in the lowland Gulf Coast region in a small area of 200 by 70 miles. It included southern Veracruz, northern Tabasco, and the small volcanic area of the Tustla Mountains next to the sea. Here, high civilization in Mexico very likely made its earliest appearance. Three major Olmec sites support this theory, the bulk of the evidence deriving from Leventa. About 12 miles inland from the Gulf of Campeche in the Tonala River lies the island of Leventa. In this remote setting, containing only two square miles of dry land, was situated the oldest major ceremonial center of prehistoric Mexico. Archaeological studies at Leventa produced a number of provocative facts. The Olmecs had built on a gargantuan scale. Although clay was their main construction material, they made great use of stones weighing up to 40 tons which had to be transported at least 80 miles to this alluvial coastal plain. The stone was used for columns, for stelae, for intricately sculptured altars depicting ritual scenes. Serpentine slabs were found buried in deep pits. At higher levels, precious jade objects in vast quantity. Nothing was found in the main site area to indicate that a populace had lived at Leventa, but tomb-like structures suggested that some individuals were buried there. Archaeologists concluded that Leventa was a detached ceremonial center of the kind which abounded in prehistoric Mesoamerica, built by non-resident laborers, maintained by a small corps of attendants, and administered by the priesthood. Only when radiocarbon dates were secured did the unique significance of the site become apparent. It was built about 800 BC, thus predating by several hundred years any previously known Mesoamerican religious center of comparable development. Construction was carried out in four phases, occurring about 100 years apart and following plans of the utmost precision. About 400 BC, all work at Leventa ceased the priests and attendants disappeared. The outlying population failed to return for either work or worship. No one knows why. We do know that for about four centuries, a very ambitious building program was successfully carried out under the direction of a small dominant group. La Venta, therefore, apparently launched the long series of Mesoamerican theocracies, which lasted until 1520 when Cortes destroyed the Aztec civilization. Much remains to be discovered about these precocious Olmecs, where they came from, what their religious motivations were, why they vanished with scarcely a derivative trace. We can only attempt to visualize their hour in history based on the archaeological findings at Leventa. 
The setting, a hot lowland region of dense tropical jungles and swamps, with an annual rainfall of about 120 inches. The one main dry season, during which any substantial outdoor work is possible, begins in late February and ends in May, lasting only 100 days or so. A small Indian group living until recently on the island supported itself by the slash and burn method of farming maize. This involves cutting the forest, drying and burning the cut vegetation, and planting over the burnt field. Climatic and geological evidence indicate that the ancients also subsisted by this agricultural system. Studies show that the island cannot sustain more than 150 persons. Since an estimated million and a quarter man days were required to build Laventa, the laborers must have come from elsewhere, probably the hilly area just west of Laventa. In theocratic government, common among early agricultural societies, the priesthood promised favorable weather and abundant crops in return for the manpower necessary to construct ceremonial centers. Laventa was almost certainly built under such an agreement. A lapse in the priesthood's success at weather control may have accounted for the abandonment of the site. Laventa's relative inaccessibility, probably considered an asset by the Olmecs, was the first problem encountered by modern parties. Clearing and burning revealed that the site extended for over half a mile along the island's low central ridge. On the surface, it consisted merely of a linear complex of clay mounds with a north-south orientation. At the south end was a great pyramid. To the north of the pyramid lay the main part of the site, composed of a central mound, a rectangular court, a large northern platform mound, a number of smaller mounds. Laventa was built in four distinct phases, a major construction effort occurring about every 100 years. In phase one, the pyramid and the two central mounds were erected. The court embankment was built, and the three platforms within the court were constructed. The earliest sandy clay floors were laid. In phase two, some existing structures were enlarged. The court's embankment was heightened by a yellow adobe brickwork wall, and the southern platforms were built. This period was marked by white sandy floor surfacings in the court. Phase three saw the enlargement of most structures and was characterized by floorings made of rose pink sandy clays. In phase four, the flanker mounds were constructed. Then a final layer of red clay was deposited over the court floor and all structures. Basalt columns were set upright around the court as well as around its two southern platforms. This was the last major alteration before the abandonment of the site. Laventa was laid out with a mathematical symmetry and authority. A line drawn from the center of the pyramid to the center of the northern mound bisects the main structures, leaving the pairs of secondary mounds equidistant on either side of this center line. The alignment, which bears eight degrees west of true north, is believed to have been astronomically determined and of ritual significance to the builders. These, then, were the main surface features of the site. Low clay platform mounds and basalt columns. Most of the Laventa treasures, even in the first millennium BC, lay below ground. Over 2,000 years later, though jungle and drift sand had erased almost every trace of the site, these treasures began to come to light. A trench dug from the foot of the pyramid through the heart of the northern mound showed that the center line indeed must have had some magical significance in Olmec religion, for precisely along it lay many of Laventa's most impressive and mystifying finds. 
Among the first encountered were several tombs, presumed to be the burial places of priests. The most imposing of these was fashioned of basalt columns atop the northern mound. Here was early evidence of the value which the Olmecs placed upon jade. This structure contained vestiges of two burials, each accompanied by a cache of precious jade objects similar to those found in the other tombs. The jade was skillfully fashioned into celts, figurines, beads, ear spools. The work, as well as the precious material, a salute to the departed dignitary. Laventa's tombs all dated from the fourth or latest construction phase, suggesting a build-up in ritual activity over the centuries, and perhaps an increase in the prestige of the priesthood. Not only the tombs had been placed so accurately along Laventa's center line, but also monuments and offerings of the three earlier periods. Here, a magnificent stone sculpture was found, the so-called Ambassador Monument. What may be early forms of calendrical glyphs or picture writing occur on this sculpture. On the left, a footprint. On the right, an oval design, a clover leaf, a bird. Directly beneath the ambassador monument, and put down at the same time, lay twenty large imitation axes made of green serpentine, another favorite material of the Olmecs. Slightly to the north, a second cache appeared, consisting of fifty-six jade and green serpentine axe blades. A third centerline offering was of particular interest. Thirty-eight jade and serpentine celts were found arranged in a cruciform pattern. Beneath them lay something absolutely unique. At the bottom of a pit, dug to a depth of thirteen feet, had been placed six layers of serpentine blocks, each carefully smoothed and shaped into rectangular form. Although the layers gave the effect of pavements, they apparently were not intended to be walked upon, or even seen. All evidence indicates that they were covered up immediately after being deposited. The serpentine layers and the cruciform jade offering were laid down at the beginning of construction phase three. The pavement itself, as determined by trenching and testing with a soil auger, was nearly 65 feet square. The digging of the pit and the transport of the stone must have involved an effort verging on the superhuman. Yet this was only one of five such buried pavements found at Laventa. Also along the center line below the great tomb was another jade offering in the form of a cross. Directly to the north, a pair of identical offerings lay just nine feet apart, equidistant from the center line. Each consisted of nine jade celts and a concave mirror. Made of metallic ores of iron and titanium, the mirrors were distinctively Olmec. They remained without parallel anywhere in the world until the relatively late advent of concave lens grinding in Europe. Sixteen feet below these small offerings lay another of the mysterious serpentine pavements, this one dating from construction phase four. The buried pavements have been interpreted as massive offerings. At least one, invariably topped by a cruciform jade offering, was put down at the beginning of each construction phase, possibly in a ceremony equivalent to the laying of a modern cornerstone. The wealth within the great northern mound may be explained by its close relationship with the ceremonial court. Here in the central plaza, the most important ritual activities of Laventa are presumed to have taken place. Barely protruding above the surface before excavation were some of the basalt columns which enclosed the court. Its dimensions were estimated at 135 by 188 feet. The columns had been added in the last building phase, perhaps as decoration, but more probably for privacy. The thick court floors, renewed each century, were by then nearly as high as the top of the phase two encircling wall. Here we assume the priests performed sacred rites guaranteeing agricultural fertility, which resulted in economic security for the outlying population. Some of these rituals are portrayed in the stone sculpture of Laventa. 
Others are suggested by the architectural design. An entryway into the court at its northeast corner offers support for this conjecture. Through it may have come ceremonial processions, or sacrificial victims, or outlying maize farmers bringing tribute for the touchy gods of fertility. Dramatic evidence of one such rite came to light on the western edge of the northeast platform. As the court floor was being excavated toward the center line, a group of figurines and celts made an unexpected appearance. From earliest exposure, it could be seen that they were arranged in a deliberate pattern. Carefully cleared of ancient sand, the heads displayed typical Olmec facial representation. Thick lips, slanting eyes, deformed skulls. At last, the group stood fully revealed. Six jade celts and sixteen figurines, thirteen made of serpentine, two of jade, and one of granite. This one is backed against a row of celts, which might be construed as a miniature palisade. Before him pass a file of four, facing in the direction of a very haughty, authoritative figure. The remaining figurines, arranged in a semicircle, appear to be watching the scene. An important ceremony is obviously taking place. The haughty person seems to be the central character. Is he priest or visiting dignitary? The lone granite figurine may be a special personage, such as a captain. The file of four advancing toward the central figure could be acolytes or dancers or sacrificial victims. Their human counterparts may have been escorted into the court through the northeast entryway. Interpretation of the surrounding strata revealed a curious fact. About 100 years after the figurines were buried, a hole was cut through the court floors exactly to the level of their heads. Someone who knew precisely where to find the group evidently looked in, then simply refilled the hole. What records were kept at Leventa so that long after the burial of an offering, it could be unerringly located? Laventa's most challenging structures were the court's two southern platforms. 1943 explorations in the southeast platform yielded an enormous mosaic mask representing the face of a jaguar, the favorite Olmec deity. In 1955, the final expedition set out to make a full-scale study of the southwest platform. Its position was marked by a 19 by 23 foot rectangle of basalt columns, some broken, some out of position, others missing. Like the columns of the court, they were associated with the last or red clay cap period. Excavation necessitated the removal of the columns, many weighing over one ton. A modern block and tackle was tried shortly to be discarded in favor of rope slings and poles with human bearers. Also associated with phase four were stone facing blocks which occurred on all sides of the platform. They were laid in varying patterns, presumably as decoration. The platform itself consisted of unfired yellow adobe bricks laid in red clay mortar. The outlines of a small exploratory test pit dug in 1942 were still visible. At the phase three level, another series of facing blocks was exposed. Upon the stratigraphic control wall, the layers of fills and floors made their appearance. The 16th and final layer of adobe bricks rested at the level of the white sandy floors of phase two. A massive fill of pink clay was next encountered. Five feet below the top of this fill, some dressed serpentine blocks began to emerge. 
It soon became apparent, as mouth, eyes, and headdress plumes appeared, that another mosaic representation of a jaguar was being uncovered. The control wall was now removed, and the jaguar mask lay fully exposed for the first time in over 2,000 years. It consisted of 485 carefully cut and smoothed serpentine blocks, an almost exact duplicate of the one found 12 years earlier in the twin platform to the east. Typically, the creators had worked on a large scale, covering an area of 15 by 20 feet. They had incorporated most of the conventional features found in other Olmec representations of the jaguar. The headdress is made up of four feathered plumes, the centers of the appendages filled with yellow clay. Four eyes are depicted, rather than the two eyes commonly found in Olmec portrayals of the jaguar. The eyebrows are plumed in the customary style. The nose is a narrow vertical panel. The mouth agape and filled with cinnamon-colored sand. In its day, before the millennia had obscured the color and polish of the serpentine, the mask must have been one of the most splendid offerings ever laid down at Leventa. With its twin in the southeast platform, it launched the phase two construction period. This second mosaic was indeed an exciting discovery. The reasons for its form, size, and deep burial still remain a mystery. But the mask was not all that the southwest platform held in store. Continued excavation revealed a layer of rough serpentine stones embedded in blue clay. While this development was being explored, the mask was carefully diagrammed. The stones were numbered and taken up, later to be reassembled at a museum. Excavation was resumed, again with a control wall bisecting the mask area. Work to east and west of it exposed a continuous pavement of the rough serpentine stones. A second, third, and fourth layer were revealed and removed from the west side of the wall. Those in the eastern half were stepped down so that portions of all four tiers were exposed in vertical relationship. As the layers continued downward, however, the eastern remnants were removed and both sides stripped down through an eighth layer. Excavation was now confined to the western side of the wall, for the layers of uneven stone chunks went on and on, becoming progressively larger and more closely packed. At the eighteenth layer, the excavation was reduced to an eight by four foot shaft. Ten more layers were laboriously cut through until a thick clay fill was encountered lying on the subsoil. Thus, the seemingly bottomless pit ended, nearly 18 feet below the jaguar mask, 31 feet below the top of the red clay cap, and 35 feet below the surface of the site as it was in 1955. The southwest platform is not only an example of superb engineering, but reflects the baffling religious psychology underlying its construction. At the beginning of phase two, an area of 50 by 61 feet was laid out and dug 23 feet deep. Where the steep sides of the pit cut through loose sand, the Olmec engineers built clay retaining walls to prevent caving. The bottom of the pit measured 41 by 49 feet. Upon it was placed a layer of rough green serpentine slabs, then a layer of clay, another layer of stones, and so on until 28 such layers had been put down. Capping the stone fill was a layer of clay, upon which had been placed the mosaic mask, enveloped in olive-colored clay. A five-foot-thick layer of pink clay was then packed on top of the mask and upon this was constructed the platform of adobe brickwork. 
In phase three, only minor alterations were made. During the phase four period, not long before the abandonment of the site, the platform was enlarged. The final red clay capping was added and the basalt columns were set in place. It has been estimated that about 100 men could have dug and filled the great pit in 80 days. 1,000 tons of serpentine slabs, over 100,000 cubic feet of clay were used to fill the pit. The serpentine had to be transported from the Pacific coast, 150 miles away. These figures reflect the enormous expenditure of human energy involved in only one of Leventa's structures. The beliefs which motivated this effort are lost in antiquity. Thus, the major part of the Leventa excavations was concluded. The huge pyramid, consisting of five million cubic feet of earth, remains largely unexcavated. Minor explorations in other mounds yielded little information. Beyond the main complex, some extraordinary stone monuments were found. Among them, the whale and the so-called rattlesnake monument on which the plumed serpent is featured. In all, some 40 pieces of stone sculpture were recovered. Over 5,000 tons of serpentine. Over 2,000 pieces of jade. Laventa, with its accumulated wealth of nearly 1,000 years, may be regarded as a national treasury, comparable to the great cathedrals of Europe. Laventa is now stripped of its monuments and jade. The symmetrical clay mounds have been destroyed by bulldozers. No further excavations are possible in the main part of the site. An oil refinery overlooks the area where ornately costumed priests once performed elaborate rituals. Essentially, the studies at Laventa show that high civilization flourished in Middle America about 1,000 years earlier than previously supposed. Throughout a 400-year period, a well-established theocracy created a ritual center in which religious beliefs were architecturally expressed. We do not know the forms of the ancient rituals. We cannot fathom the meaning of the buried pavements. Nor do we know why the site was abandoned at an apparent peak of development. The excavations, however, do offer us a glimpse into prehistory. When priest kings ruled at Leventa, when priest kings ruled at Leventa, when priest kings ruled at Levanta and the populace toiled in honor of the awesome Jaguar God.